Hello and welcome to module 6-7 in our continuing journey through the different GNSS constellations. Uh, in this video, we're going to look at Galileo, the satellite navigation system operated by the European Union. So uh, in our neighborhood of satellites, we'll, we see that Galileo lives here in medium Earth orbit at a noticeably higher orbit than GPS. So from Kepler's laws, we expect it to have a longer orbit period, and we'll see that in a minute. So this is uh, the set of orbits uh, planned for Galileo. At the moment, there are only three operational Galileo satellites, but the plan is to have 30 uh, with three orbital planes and 10 in each orbital plane. You'll remember this is very similar to GLONASS, which has three orbital planes with eight satellites in each orbital plane. The uh, inclination angle is 56 degrees, and you'll see the pattern emerging. Uh, we had GPS with 55 degrees inclination angle, GLONASS with 66, and Galileo with 56. The inclination angle is chosen to give good coverage over the region. Uh, that owns and operates the satellites. Even though it's a global system, of course, the operators want it to give good coverage over the citizens of their region. And so in this case, that's Europe. And you can see from the, the ground traces here, just, just like with all MEOs, any particular satellite traces out something like the lion on a tennis ball as the satellite does its orbit and the Earth spins around underneath. And the highest latitude where you'll see a Galileo satellite overhead is 56 degrees north or south. Now, uh, if you've been uh, paying attention uh, recently in the, in the last uh, month, uh, August, September period of 2014, Galileo satellites were very much in the news because there was a launch of the first two fully operational ve vehicles, they call them vehicles, the first two fully operational satellites. And the launch went OK, but ended up placing the satellites in a lower orbit than expected. And so this was widely reported, as you see here. And so I thought we should look at exactly what happened uh, and where those satellites are. So what I'm showing here is, in blue, the expected orbits of the two Galileo satellites that were recently, recently launched. In white is a GPS orbit for a single GPS satellite, just for reference. And I, we should ex I should explain what it takes to get a satellite up into a particular orbit. Remember, uh, we've been talking about these inclination angles, and we say that you know, this constellation had such an inc inclination angle, and that has a different one, and they've got this uh, size of orbit. Well, that doesn't just happen. You've got to get the rocket to shoot the satellite up there so that it ends up in that particular orbit. So for example, uh, for this particular Galileo satellite here, the launch happens in French Guiana, somewhere there. The rocket takes off. It's got a alter its trajectory so that this rocket goes higher and higher, and then at some point will release the satellite. And at that stage, you would have one satellite there will release the other one. You have two satellites right next to each other. And if you do everything right, you will be at the correct inclination angle, and the satellite will then begin to orbit, just following Kepler's laws and under the influence of nothing but gravity. And then the way you, you separate them is that there's a, a small amount of propulsive power on the satellite. They can like, shoot a little jet, push that little jet of nitrogen, kind of like an aerosol can, in fact, to just a little burst that satellite boosted up into a slightly higher orbit by Kepler's uh, third law. If it's in a higher orbit, it must have a longer period. So it'll, go, it'll fall around that orbital plane slower than its friend ahead of it, and it will, relative to its friend, it'll it'll fall back to here. At that stage, you do the opposite. You put it back into the into the orbit you wanted, and then you'd find your satellite over there. And this is a very difficult thing to do. This 
actually is rocket science. And what happened is that the release happened a little bit early, and those two satellites ended up right over there at a slightly smaller orbit than uh, GPS instead of at the orbital altitude uh, of Galileo. And with uh, a, a, the wrong inclination and a, a significant uh, eccentricity, it came out with E equaled about 0 0.24. And you'll remember that when we were looking at QZSS, where the, the, the Japanese satellite system, where they deliberately wanted to have some eccentricity to give that asymmetric eight, remember that from the previous uh, videos, uh, in that case, they had an eccentricity of 0 0.074. So, so, and that, that, that was deliberately eccentric orbit. So this 0 0.24 is quite significantly eccentric. It's, it's hard to see just with the naked eye, but you can kind of imagine that you can see a slightly larger gap there than what you're getting here from the, what are essentially circular orbits uh, of GPS and the intended Galileo orbit. So that's where those two Galileo satellites went to. And now they're just under the influence of gravity. So they're actually OK. There's, um, what you might say is there's no such thing as a wrong orbit. There's only the orbit. And then you can solve the orbital parameters and, and say what it is and use it in a receiver. And time will tell whether these satellites can actually get used. There's, there's, uh, on the face of it, there's, there's nothing inherently terribly wrong with that orbit. The satellite's at about the right altitude so that the link budget would be about right. You remember we worked out link budgets and so on. So you could imagine as an exercise for yourself, you could be given this problem maybe, and maybe one of you will be given this problem one day for real, that we have these orbits. What changes? How different uh, are the pseudo ranges going to be? How different is the link budget going to be? The signal power might be about a dB stronger, work out why, and so on. It would make a, a great problem uh, for an exercise or for real life. So that's what happened to the, the two most recent Galileo satellites. Uh, if they were in their correct orbit, uh, they would be at 23,200 kilometers. And as before, with the other systems, the system designers have chosen the orbital altitude such that the orbit period is an integer fraction, in this case, 10 over 17. And we've learned now what to ask ourselves with that kind of orbital period. We ask ourselves, how long does it take the satellite to do 17 orbits? And so that's another little quiz for you to fill in. And then once you've got that answer, you can answer the question, what is the repeat period of the apparent orbit of a Galileo satellite? So now you've completed that. I'll fill it in here. So how long does it take? Gala, well, it's doing, it's once it needs to do 17 orbits, multiplied by 10 seventeenths of a sidereal day equals 10 days. Nice and simple. So 10 sidereal days to do 17 orbits. So then, as we've discussed before, after any integer number of sidereal days, the Earth is back where it started in terms of its rotation with respect to inertial space. The satellite's back where it started because it did 17 complete orbits. And so the whole system repeats every 10 sidereal days for Galileo. So now, what about the signals? Uh, Galileo is the system that, uh, apart from QZSS, which is which is designed to be GPS-like and, and, and very much copies the GPS system. Galileo is the system, apart from QZSS, that's most interoperable with GPS. And it's designed in that way. There's been a lot of cooperation uh, with the US and the European Union to make this happen. And so what you'll see is that there's a signal exactly on L1, and there's a signal exactly on L5. And what we should start noticing through as we work our way through these different constellations in that L1 and L5 are the two most commonly used uh, frequencies. And so the future of dual frequency receivers for civilian use is L1 and L5. And as I mentioned previously, uh, we might actually see 
uh, GNSS receivers in consumer products like cell phones in the future with dual frequency. At the moment, everything in a cell phone is L1 only. And Galileo has a signal on L1. And you'll, if you look carefully at what this amplitude spectrum looks like, you'll notice that split spectrum, the Bach encoding that is going to be on GPS-3 and is already on the Galileo signals. And that gives you this split spectrum so that it doesn't interfere with the GPS-CA code, which is right in the middle there with its uh, CA code. That's the GPS code right there, which is a BPSK encoding. So Galileo is designed like that to, to avoid interfering with the GPS CA code. And then they have another signal on L5. As well as another signal in the middle, it's something called E6. And you'll notice this, this terminology. We've got E1 instead of L1. Just like with Beidou, it was called B1. But in terms of the frequency, E1 is the same thing as L1. E5A is the same thing as L5, just for the different system. So those are the signals. So the current. Galileo status. Uh, as before, you can look in the GPS World Almanac to go and find information. Uh, what you'll find listed there, there are the original two test satellites, GOVA A and B, are listed there, but they are no longer operational, so I'll just cross those out. And then we have the four so-called IOV satellites, which stands for in-orbit validation. So these are uh, test satellites, but operational test satellites. And uh, there are three of these currently operating. And so that's the current status of Galileo. There are th uh, three operational satellites in two orbital planes, as shown in this picture here. So there's two operating in one plane and one operating in another plane. And then, as we mentioned, there are these two fully operational vehicles in orbit, but not currently operating because they just recently got put there and they're in that lower or lower than expected orbit. And so uh, time will tell what happens to those satellites. Uh, one interesting thing about Galileo, like QZSS, they like to name their satellites. You'll remember QZSS has one satellite and it has a name, Michibiki. And Galileo satellites were named in an interesting way, or are being named in an interesting way. Uh, children throughout Europe uh, get invited to enter an art competition, submit their art, and the winners uh, get to have satellites named after them. And then supposedly the satellite names will reflect uh, the European population. So this, is, this one is Tais. This one is Natalia. This one is David. This one is Sif. And these two are Milena and Dorisa. You don't see much mention of them lately on account of their slightly lower orbit than expected. So on behalf of the uh, satellite community, we should all apologize to Milena and Dorisa for having their satellites slightly not where they should be. If you want more of information and technical information, uh, especially, then this is the European website uh, that's responsible for Galileo and has uh, lots of information there. Like all the systems, uh, Galileo has an interface specification. It's uh, the fanciest looking of all. This is what it looks like. And inside is uh, all the specs, just like you have uh, with GPS, GLONASS, etc.